Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here, both to those of you who are, who are here in person and to those of you who are joining us online. Um, I'm Jamil Jaffer. I'm the director of the Knight Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to this symposium on lies, free speech, and the law. Uh, we have a very rich day ahead of us, which is why you're here, so I'm going to be very brief. But it's really wonderful to see you here this morning. As many of you already know, there are three pillars to the Knight Institute's work, strategic litigation, research, and public education. When we started out five years ago, it was relatively clear to me what a successful litigation program would look like. It was far less obvious to me what the research program should look like. It could have gone in many different directions. But we considered different models and we were fortunate to get good advice from a lot of thoughtful people. Uh, and we also experimented because all life is an experiment as Emerson said before Holmes said it. Um, and over time, the Institute's research program has grown into something quite exciting and I think distinctive. A large part of the credit for that belongs to Katie Glenn Bass, uh, who has overseen the program for the past three years. For me and for everyone at the Knight Institute, it has been really gratifying to see the program evolve and flourish under Katie's steady hand uh, and with the collaboration of many other Knight Institute staff, some of whom are here with us today, including Lorraine Kenny, Candace White, uh, and Madeline Wood, among others. I want to mention one other person before I introduce President Bollinger, uh, and that is, of course, Genevieve Lakier, who, as senior visiting scholar at the Knight Institute, has overseen this year-long project on lies in the law. This has been an exceptionally rich and ambitious initiative, and it has encompassed um, five public roundtables, a series of written interventions by legal scholars, litigators, uh, historians, technologists, uh, and of course, today's symposium as well. Professor Lakier has brought an amazing amount of energy and creativity to this project. And for all of us at the Institute, it's really been a privilege and delight uh, to work with her. You'll have the chance to hear from her directly in just a few minutes. But first, uh, I'm so pleased that President Bollinger is here with us this morning. He became the 19th president of this university in 2002. Uh, and is now the longest serving president of an Ivy League university. Anyone connected with Columbia already knows how much stronger uh, and truly global this university has become as a result of his tenure. Lee is also, of course, one of the country's foremost scholars of free speech. He's written incisively about the meaning of the First Amendment regulation of media and the challenges of new technology. This year, Oxford University Press will publish his latest project, a collection of essays co-edited with Jeff Stone on social media, free speech, and the future of democracy. From my own perspective, of course, President Bollinger's signal achievement was launching the Knight Institute, which he did with um, Alberto Ibarguen of the Knight Foundation just over five years ago. One of the most rewarding aspects of my role as director of the Institute has been the opportunity to work with and learn from Lee, who is as thoughtful about institution building as he is about the First Amendment. Columbia is very fortunate to have his leadership. The First Amendment is fortunate to have his lifelong dedication. And we at the Knight Institute are fortunate to have had such an inspiring supporter of our work. Please join me in welcoming him. So uh, it is a very, very great pleasure and um, a sincere one uh, to be able to make a few remarks uh, by way of opening uh, this symposium on lies, free speech, and the law. I would like to begin by recognizing the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia. Uh, there is nothing that has happened at Columbia in the past two decades that gives me more pride or means more to me than the creation of the Institute. 
It was a collaboration with the Knight Foundation, as Jamil said, and its president, Alberto Ibarguen, that yielded this idea of having a center for the promotion and understanding and actions in defense of including litigation principles of freedom of speech and press under the constitution. And it has been its founding director, Jamil Jaffer, who has made this idea into a living and very effective reality. The Institute is a remarkable thing for a university to undertake as a university. And it is very satisfying to see it flourish and to be so universally supported, especially through gatherings like this. I have only a few thoughts to offer on the subject of this symposium. I have, of course, spent a good deal of my life thinking about the First Amendment and the vast stretches of human life that are connected to those fundamental and seminal principles. Falsehoods and how to deal with them are an inevitable set of puzzles in that quest until recently, say in the last decade or so, I think it would be fair to say that we had a pretty well-established and well-regarded set of thoughts and practices about how to deal with them in the variety of contexts in which they occur. Indeed, phrases like, quote, the central meaning of the First Amendment, or just the phrase, uninhibited, robust, and wide open, immediately called to mind a dialogue we were all very practiced at articulating, repeating, and doing so with conviction. But the emergence of the internet, our newest and perhaps most significant technology of communication ever, and its associated privately controlled platforms, together with the chronic political and cultural divisions in the society, that have clogged the self-governing process and given rise to various threats to democracy have changed all of this. I have now, as uh, Jamil mentioned, an, a very long-standing and very productive collaboration with Jeff Stone of the University of Chicago Law School, known of course to virtually everyone here. And our newest project is on the general subject of this symposium. The most recent volume we have completed is titled Social Media, Freedom of Speech and the Future of Our Democracy, and it will be published in a few months by Oxford. Several of you are in fact authors in this new book, including our next speaker, Genevieve Laker. As with other projects, Jeff and I have undertaken the book. This book provides a framing of the problems by us followed by essays from a large group of authors from different life experiences and areas of expertise, and then a report with concrete recommendations from a commission we formed to consider the different perspectives. There would be many things to say in a general summary of the contributions by the participants, but for purposes of these very brief remarks, to open this conference, I would emphasize just four. First, there is a consensus among the participants that disinformation, falsehoods, propaganda, whatever one calls it, is a very complex phenomenon and not easily characterized and not by any means easily understood. One has to be careful, therefore, not to oversimplify the problem as one involving truths and falsehoods. Second, there is a consensus that the current state of affairs, certainly in the United States, poses a degree of threats to democracy and to the necessary political and social culture that must undergird a democratic system of government that it is unlike anything we have seen in at least a half century. The problems we are talking about in the project and in this conference appear to be of a different order of magnitude. Third is the wide disagreement about what can or should be done about the state of affairs at the levels of law, policy, and the First Amendment. 
Some among us believe that the framework of the First Amendment that has evolved over the last 100 years, but certainly in the last half century, should not be, does not need to be, significantly altered in the face of these new threats and risks. But others among us believe the opposite, that an entirely new framework is both called for and an imperative if we are to survive as a constitutional republic. The key point is that this is one of the most complex, controversial, momentous debates in my lifetime about how to think about free speech and press under the First Amendment. Hence the significance too of this meeting. The fourth and final point I would make is one that is more my own than derived from the thinking of the authors and commissioners of our little project. It is simply the observation that we not fall into the trap of thinking that we have never encountered anything like these issues before. Perhaps the magnitude of the problems uh, is greater. But the nature of the problems and the availability of complex ways of approaching them are not. We have encountered major new technologies before in the last century, uh, notably broadcasting. Many, if not all, of the dilemmas we feel now were felt then and continue on to this very moment. It is a very difficult intellectual exercise to analyze how that system of legislation, administrative policies, and constitutional doctrine came about, and even more elusive to explain what it all signifies, given the very different approaches that we took to the parallel print media. One can say it was a vast mistake and should be jettisoned. One can say it was perhaps correct for its time, but not for ours, either in the sensibilities it reflected or in the practicalities or relevance for our problems. Or one can say, as I believe to be true, that there is still relevance in the spirit of what happened, what was allowed, what was feared, and how the society responded that gives us some source of ideas for dealing with the issues in our times. What one cannot say is that we have never encountered or responded in complex ways to threats such as we perceive to be present in our world today. Thank you for letting me make these few remarks. It's now my pleasure to introduce Genevieve, who is a professor of law at the University of Chicago and the Institute's vis senior visiting research scholar. She is an expert on the First Amendment, the relationship between free speech and the law, and the current battles over speech on social media platforms. She has been a leading Knight Institute's research project, or been leading the Knight Institute's research project focusing on lies and the law and has been instrumental in organizing this and other discussions on the topic as part of her work as a visiting scholar. But I can say having edited her work that she has a first rate mind and a wonderful perspective on all the issues that we face here. Please join me in welcoming Genevieve. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. So it is both a pleasure and a privilege to be here to welcome you to today's symposium. As Jamil mentioned, today is the culminating event in a year long series of events that I have organized along with the Knight First Amendment Institute to explore the democratic problem posed by lies and more broadly false speech. Now, this is obviously a problem that has been the topic of a great uh, deal of conversation in recent months, years. It is hard to go a week, in fact, without coming across a study, a conference, or a news report uh, talking about the problem of disinformation and misinformation and the threat it poses to American society. Um, and in fact, as we sit here today, there is another very high profile conference on this exact topic happening at another somewhat distinguished university that I happen to know something about uh, right this moment. 
Now, I won't name that other conference, but I'd like to congratulate you on choosing the obviously superior option today. <laughs> so why then organize yet another symposium on the problem of lies and false speech? Well, the aim of the roundtables I organized uh, with Knight over the course of this year, and the aim of today's symposium has been to deepen and maybe depart from a lot of the popular discourse about the problem of false speech in several ways. First, as befits a First Amendment Institute, a major goal of this year's events has been to think more deeply about the First Amendment questions raised by the problems of false speech and by the efforts to regulate it. Now, this is a topic, the sort of the role and the constraints the First Amendment poses when we are thinking about false speech, that has been surprisingly absent from much of the popular conversation about lies and information. And perhaps it is because those who uh, participate in these conversations often assume that the commitment to freedom of speech means that the government simply cannot regulate lies and that primary decision makers in this context will instead therefore have to be the private companies, in particular the social media companies, that so often play the role of both hero and villain in much of the discourse about lies. But in fact, as many of the papers for today's symposium make clear, the First Amendment's constraints on the government's power to regulate lies are not nearly so absolute. The government regulates lies all the time, perfectly or imperfectly constitutionally, but at least somewhat constitutionally, uh, in the commercial context. Great swaths of the laws of property and contract are organized around prohibitions against materially false information. In many other areas of law as well, immigration law, criminal law, defamation law, the law prohibits and the government enforces Prohibition, prohibitions against fraud and intentional or at the very least reckless deception. And this is part of the everyday fabric and operation of American law. Moreover, the view of the justices who fashion constitutional law when it comes to the topic of lies and misinformation may be changing because the justices have been and are being affected as we are all affected by pervasive anxiety about what President Obama the keynote speaker at the other uh, conference I shall not name, uh, once described as the epistemic crisis facing American democracy. So Justices Gorsuch and Thomas, for example, have both recently written opinions in which they argued that the constitutional rules uh, regarding uh, libel law should change to respond to what Justice Thomas described as the proliferation of falsehoods in American society. Constitutional law is a product of society and culture just like everything else. And the First Amendment changes in response to changing uh, public um, uh, perception, changing perceptions of the threats facing free speech today. And so one of the goals of this event this year has been to explore what constraints the First Amendment does impose on government efforts to regulate uh, a more truth-based public sphere into existence, and what constraints the First Amendment should impose on the government when it does so, assuming that the doctrinal lines may be less fixed the First Amendment may be less static than it is often assumed to be. A second goal of this year's events has been to push against the techno-determinism and present presentism that plagues a lot of the conversation about lies and misinformation. Anxiety about the problems that false speech pose to American uh, democracy tends to very often focus on the problem of lies on social media. It is often assumed that the reason why America is today facing an epistemic crisis is because of the new technological affordances of the social media platforms, which allow the dissemination of falsehoods at previously unimaginable speed, and the economic self-interest that leads the social media companies to enable or encourage the proliferation of false speech on their platforms. And while uh, technology and economic self-interest certainly help to play a role in explaining the problems plaguing American democracy today, they are by no means the only explanations available to us. And so one of the ambitions of this year's events has been to focus or refocus the conversation of li about lies and misinformation away from its familiar focus on big tech and to ask more historical, political and sociological questions, such as, for example, whether the epistemic crisis America is facing today is in fact a novel phenomenon or instead is, as President Bollinger suggested, something we have encountered before. Whether its primary drivers are in fact the social media companies and uh, or instead, whether there are deeper historical, economic, and political and institutional uh, uh, explanations and drivers. A question that has loomed over the roundtables that we have organized this year, and that I think looms over today's events, is the question of whether and to what extent the problem with American democracy can in fact be blamed on false speech and false belief, 
or whether lies and misinformation are merely a symptom of deeper economic, political, and institutional problems. I've joked a lot over the course of the last year that I set out to organize a series of uh, events about the problems of uh, lies, but it turns out that the branding um, has been fake news. Again and again during these conversations, it has turned out that lies are just the surface manifestations of deeper problems, perhaps not the problems themselves or a problem by itself. Now, this doesn't make it less important, I think, to talk about lies and the threat they may pose to American democracy or how we should regulate them. In many ways, it makes it more important because it turns out pulling on the thread of false speech opens up all kinds of really interesting and important questions about American politics and society. Questions like, what do we mean when we talk about a democratic public sphere? How democratic do we really want the public sphere to be? What are the kinds of institutions that we, should, we think should mediate it? What is the role of expertise in democracy? And how do party structures and economic logics organize and undermine what what courts in First Amendment cases tend to describe as the marketplace of ideas. These are all questions that are raised either implicitly or explicitly by many of the papers that participants wrote for today's symposium. These papers, I should say, repay in spades the hopes I and the Knight Institute had for this project. They're interdisciplinary, they're historically sensitive, they are doctrinally uh, complex, and they're often quite provocative in the arguments they make. And I cannot wait to hear the discussion they generate. So to that end, I will stop talking now so that we can actually get into that discussion. Uh, just before I leave uh, the podium, I wanted to say thank you to all the people at the Knight Institute who worked so hard to make this uh, symposium and this year long series of events possible. First, I wanted to say thank you to Jamil, who has been a wonderful uh, collaborator, provocateur uh, and supporter for this project. To Katie Glenn Bass, without whom none of this really, honestly, none of this would be possible. Um, to Madeline, uh, Lorraine Kenny, and Kitty Ahmed, who did so much work to make the logistics come together, to Candace White and Adam Glenn, who produced the amazing digital and video uh, work for this project, and to Peter Sizaholsky, who produced the uh, beautiful art uh, that we're going to be showcasing later today. This was a team effort, a, lot, a product of a lot of collaboration uh, back and forth, and I hope today's symposium will feel the same. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, let's get started.